Welcome to this brief film about English and British sculpture. Uh, let's begin right at the beginning with something which can't really entirely be described as a sculpture, but is Stonehenge, an enormous and sort of semi-celestial monument, the better part of two thousand, the better part of four thousand years old. Grim, Chthonian, profound, a pagan cathedral, freestanding. The Christianity of 2,000 years left it alone. And in a strange way, the English and British monumental tradition in stone begins with this piece. There's an extraordinary leap as well across the better part of four millennia to modernist sculpture, which Henry Moore like epitomises the primitive and the fierce and the primeval and even the tribal. So let's begin this analysis of what we have done three-dimensionally in the arts with the first cathedral that has come down to us on these islands from the ancient world. Here we move on in time to a Celtic horse mask from southern Scotland, circa 200 BC or thereabouts, slightly dented now as it comes down to us, pre-Germanic in feel, ancient Celtic, the symbolism of, of snakes, almost, and swirls, and that patterning that Celtic art so beloves. Obviously it's an item that comes from the battlefield and is essentially a piece of armour to protect a horse or to signify the power of a horse. And in it we see something of pre-Germanic Britain, of a Britain which is yet to be influenced by Romans or people of Germanic ancestry. A Britishness that is differentiated in terms of how we perceive it the better part of 2,000 years on. Many of these items, small and large, particularly coins, have come down to us, often elongated, often with slightly surreal shapes. Celtic craftsmen weren't interested in realism and their art was essentially not abstract but mystagogic and followed from the nature of their legends and their myths. Here we move forward to the influence of the Roman civilization on the British Isles. This is a particularly British interpretation of a classical legend. It's the head of a Medusa the snakes as hair swirling around the actual physiognomy of the piece. Yet this piece isn't really Italianate, it's not that classical in feel, it's uh, very British and even English. It was found in Bath and in the West Country and it comes to look, to my mind, as a sort of heavy piece, some solemn, uh, fiercely etched, um, non-classical in its lineaments, a sort of transliteration of Romanesque art into British terms. We've taken their material and interpreted it in accordance with our craftsmen and you can leap forward almost to the images on the outside of steeples in the Middle Ages from this type of art. Fierce, slightly primitive, you can almost sense uh, an Italian of the area who would wince but we've taken it into ourselves and made something different out of it. Yet yes, here we have something in the same era a British variation on a Roman theme, uh, two images uh, for the price of one, one of them extraordinarily modernist looking. Uh, the one on the uh, left as you look at it could almost be a piece by Elizabeth Frink, say, from the middle of the 20th century. But again, these are British takes on Roman ideas about their gods, one from Gloucester, the other from Northumberland. Uh, one thing you will notice about them is their heaviness, their three-dimensionality, uh, their earthy solidity. There's a certain absence of, sort of classical lightness, but there's a uh, uh, primeval and uh, deeper consciousness, a more northwestern European consciousness, not a southern European one. Again, we've taken Roman cultural archetypes, motifs and forms into ourselves, and our craftsmen have obeyed their Roman masters, but in a sense they've produced something uh, which is ir irredeemably British. Here we have a Northumbrian Christian cross leaping nine centuries forward from the last exhibit. Uh, very Christian. 
slightly Romanesque, smallish figures outlined in semi-relief against the texture of the cross as it goes up. Uh, to my mind there still seems to be certain pre-Christian iconographic elements to the piece. Uh, the thing that strikes me though is that differentiated from the Celtic art that we looked at before but very much in spirit with the more Roman art that we evaluated a moment previous to this, there's a solidity to the piece, a strength, an insularity and a grandeur which goes through all British three-dimensional art, whether Celtic, Romanesque, Christian, explicitly pagan, uh, restorationist, modernistic, this sense not of heaviness but of uh, the gentility of strength and of a sort of resonential power to three-dimensional space. Here moving on in time we sense a Saxon and an explicitly Germanic influence in Christian English art as we can now call it. Uh, the sculpture is still embedded on a wall, on a plane, it's partly a relief but as you can see from its three-dimensionality the figure of the crucified Christ wants to come out of the wall and is almost, one could say, 50% three-dimensional. It's not going to take too much for it to burst out of the wall, off the cross, and be a configured figure in its own right. Again, we see not just the Christian influence, ideologically and theologically, but that element of profundity and heaviness and truth to materials and prior solidity, uh, which I believe is a quintessential part of English and British three-dimensional form. It's interesting that these things remain extant no matter the change in historical period or the overlying culture. We pass from a primeval paganism to a Celtic influence to an influence of Imperial Rome to an influence of early Middle Ages Christianity and yet some of the abiding ethnic themes that lie behind the delineation of three-dimensional art remain the same.